So in essence, what you're seeing is extreme sexual frustration. This is a room full of women who are looking for some guy to come by and give them some pollen so they can create seeds. And they try harder and harder as time passes. And the more unsuccessful they are, the more the production of the resins that is intended to attract pollen increase. And that increases the psychoactive elements of the plant. They are the best gardeners of my generation, I realized at a certain point. You know, the best gardeners of my generation are not hybridizing roses, are not, you know, working with orchids. They're working with this incredibly valuable, incredibly interesting plant called cannabis. If this turns into anything good, though, look at it. I mean, this is how thick the stock is when it's just gone to bloom. It's got a beautiful shape. It is yeah, nice. I mean, think about it. This thing's a weed. Yeah. It's a weed. It's a weed that's worth, you know, in the open market, like, you know, six, seven thousand dollars a pound. Pretty good for a weed, huh? But cannabis only fetches that price because of that one particular molecule it makes that gets people high. Its name is THC, and it was discovered back in 1964 in a lab in Jerusalem by chemist Raphael Meshulam. Cannabis had not been well investigated, which was strange. After all, it was being used illegally or illegally by millions of people, and yet we didn't know that much about it. So I thought it's a good idea to look at it again from a modern point of view. In the lab, Meshulam and his colleagues broke cannabis down and zeroed in on the chemical components that might be causing its effects. We isolated about 10 compounds. Surprisingly, out of the 10 compounds we isolated, only one, which now is known as delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, in short THC, only one causes the well-known uh, high. We tested it in, in humans, many of my friends, and we saw that the compound is effective as we expected it to be. The identification of THC answered one question, but raised another. Just what did it do to the brain? I had always assumed that people knew how marijuana worked. It surprised me, actually, when I began looking in the research literature that, that it was really clear that no one really knew how it worked. In 1988, Alin Howlett found the answer. She discovered that deep inside the brain, THC molecules activate a previously unknown network of specialized chemical receptors. So that was proof that there is a receptor protein in the brain that can bind to the uh, THC, like a key in a lock. It was very exciting because what that meant to us was we had a tool that could be used for studying, and other researchers could use it as well. And people could study where the receptor was in the brain. Howlett and other scientists found the receptors in the hippocampus, which forms memories, the cerebellum, which controls movement, and the frontal cortex, where we think. Here were these receptors that this chemical produced by a plant out in the world just so happened to have the precise combination to unlock. What an extraordinary thing that is. Um, is that why that receptor network existed, so that people could get high? We don't have those receptors just so that people can get high smoking pot. Receptors are developed in neurons so that they can communicate with a chemical that the body makes. So that was the logic behind going in and trying to extract a compound in the brain that would act just like marijuana did. And in 1992, proof came that the brain does make a compound very much like THC. It was discovered by none other than Raphael Meshulam, who named it anandamide. We call it the brain's own marijuana because the compound that is made by the brain, anandamide, shares all the properties in terms of, at the receptor level and cellular level, that uh, THC has. It turns out that when anandamide is released in the brain, like marijuana, it affects such basic things as appetite, pain, and memory. <laughs> 